workshop at the Lawrence Center, which was really great. <laughs> we were discussing for an entire week, uh, really you know, agitated discussions about what next in, in particle physics in particular, in fundamental physics. And the thing is, um, Gia is, uh, is an incredibly original thinker, as you are about to see. But, um, you know, there, there are lots of people who work on the interface between gravity and particle physics. But of the lots of people that work there, uh, a lot of that effort is mathematics. But I think you're going to see today that Gia works on the interface between gravitational physics and particle physics. And the physics 24-7 is just fantastic. So uh, I'm going to keep this very short. He's well known for many things, but I guess, can I call it brain worlds? Yes. Why not? <laughs> yeah. you, you, you know the idea that we live on a higher dimensional um, space and uh, we, we live in a three plus one dimensional brain in the higher dimensional space. And so that idea dates back to a paper of, uh, well, the, one of the first uh, proper implementations of that idea, uh, which has been on and off during time is back to a paper of Gia with uh, Arkani Hamed and Dimopoulos. Uh, a year later that was uh, taken up by Randall and Sundrum, which you probably also heard of. Um, he's also, I mean that, that has like 15,000 citations to combine or whatever, some, some great number. But uh, so he's worked on so many things also, not only associated to idea of the brain, but also in cosmology, in fact, brain cosmology, was also dates back to here. Yeah. Um, uh, brain inflation, I mean. Uh, there was uh, all sorts of uh, another very important contribution to studying how gravity can be modified so that it's not just Newtonian on short distances, but uh, does something else. And again, that's uh, Gia's behind that with, uh, with uh, Gavaratsi and Porati. Um, and uh, I really, I mean, there's so many things that I, I don't, uh, and I also certainly don't want to steal his thunder for what he's going to talk about today, which is, again, totally different and uh, always slightly related, but not, uh, not at all. So let me just say that, uh, you know, he's um, delocalized by nature. <laughs> He has for many, many years been at CERN, at NYU. At NYU he has a, a, something called a silver professorship, oh. which means that he could come and go and whatever. Um, and uh, at CERN, at some point he okay. left CERN, but CERN said, no, we keep you, okay, so they kept him. And uh, eventually, so uh, 2008, uh, Germany came to the rescue, and we, I think, have him in Europe now. Um, he has a Humboldt, uh, he, he got a Humboldt professorship in 2008 and that somehow led to the, the, his current position as professor and chair of theoretical physics at uh, Ludwig Maximilians Universität. I don't think that's a German spelling, sorry. I've been here too long. And uh, also a director at Max Planck Institute, so um, we're really happy that uh, he is closer than he has been. We are happy to offer him another localization at the Lawrence, uh, at the Institute Lawrence for the next two months as our Lawrence professor. And uh, you know, short of telling you that he has a bunch of awards, among them, uh, I don't know, New York City Mayor's Excellence Award for, uh, no, Award for Excellence in Science and Technology right. and uh, the Packard Fellowship and the Sloan Fellowship and whatever. I, I just leave the room to him and uh, I hope you will enjoy the ride because it's going to be Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for the uh, introduction and, and, and deserve. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and great honor to be here and uh, to present this colloquium and to be here to spending time as, as, as Lawrence Professor. Uh, it's a fantastic group and fantastic place. And um, thank you very much for coming. So I will um, try to share some ideas that I'm very excited about with you. Um, uh, so this um, whole thing started as uh, uh, trying to understand black holes, but then it evolved uh, to something, uh, as you will see, uh, more general. Of course, again, I mean, 
still black holes are uh, main main focus, but uh, but uh, some a few things emerge which are uh, uh, very interesting. And okay, will be self-explanatory. So let me just um, uh, move on. Um, so this is an, about understanding how different physical systems uh, store information, process information, uh, and uh, what is the connection between this and unitarity, which is the, 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 one of the central concepts of physics and particle physics. Okay, so let me first fix units. Um, so I will be working in units in which the speed of light is one. Uh, at the moment, I will keep h bar explicit, but later I will set it also equal to one. Uh, Planck's constant. Um, G Newton here is uh, Newton's constant. So as you know very well, in Newtonian gravity or in Einstein gravity, uh, we have Newton's law. So the, the objects gravitate and they create uh, and they um, generate force and potential energy um, that is uh, controlled by Newton's constant. Uh, now, Newton's constant is a classical uh, constant. It means that it doesn't contain h bar. If you take uh, h bar going to zero, which normally we discuss as classical limit, uh, Newton's constant stays there, okay? Um, However, um, you can make up a, a, a length scale, a something of dimensionality of length scale, of length square, uh, by multiplying h bar by Newton's constant. And this length scale turns out to be extremely important length scale, not just in gravity, but in nature. So we call this a Planck length. Um, it's minuscule. It's uh, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So. Um, but it's, it's a very important length scale, in particular for, uh, the, for accounting for information, as you will see. Uh, correspondingly, there is uh, associated mass, the Planck mass. Again, an extremely important mass scale. By the way, I had some wine, so it's, uh, uh, you, you should normalize. Uh, I, I was told that usually I don't drink before talks, but I was told that there's a tradition here that I, I have too, so, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, so the Planck mass is given by inverse of, of, of Planck length, it's, and that's uh, approximately 10 to the minus 5 centimeters. Uh, sorry, 10 to the minus, you see the wine effect of the wine. 10 to the minus 5 grams, uh, or 10 to, the nine, 10 to the 19 GV. Uh, by the way, that's the mass of, um, uh, I was told that that's the mass of a, a cell. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an ex extremely high mass from the point of view of particle physics. Actually, it represents uh, a boundary between uh, particles and classical objects, in particular black holes. So in other words, in, in theory, with Einstein gravity, there is no way to have an elementary particle which is heavier than the Planck mass. Any elementary particle heavier than the Planck mass will become a classical object. It will become a black hole. Okay. Now, um, now, in classical gravity, so any object, has an associated gravitational radius, so-called Schwarzschild radius, which is two times G Newton times M. So I'm just displaying these two, uh, later I will forget all two and pi's and this kind of constants. The important will be scalings. Later I will set these two equal to one, but uh, here, um, okay, there is this um, gravitational radius. Now what's, what's the physical meaning of gravitational radius? It's a radius, so if you, if you localize any object, beyond the Schwarzschild radius, it will become a black hole, okay? So for example, Earth, gravitational radius of the Earth is approximately one centimeter. So if you contract the Earth down to one centimeter, it, be it will become a black hole. Now, classically, uh, black holes, they have certain properties, which, which are pretty well understood. Classically, they're all possible, um, no here theorems, um, and uh, there's a long list of, of papers that uh, arrive to those here. And so what does it mean? So this means that now normally objects, they have features, right? So they have colors, shapes, uh, multiples, and so on. But once you collapse a, an object into a black hole, it loses features. So classically, it becomes featureless. So black holes, they carry no features. In other words, uh, you can translate it as a memory. So black holes, they they don't remember where they come from. 
So end, end result is only governed by a mass, uh, angular momentum, and charge, very few quantum numbers. So therefore, the, the, therefore this looks, it looks like that uh, classically black hole carries no information because it has no features, right? Uh, that's, so remember, if we, if we want to communicate, we send messages to each other, right? We always send messages using systems in which you can rearrange features. So systems that are featureless, you cannot use for sending a message, okay? And so it looks like that classically, I cannot use a black hole to communicate because if I send you a black hole, uh, it looks like it has no features or there's not much information we can, we can share, okay? So it looks like. This is so-called, sometimes people refer to this as black hole no hair theorems. Um, now, there's, so once you go to a quantum theory, so in classical theory you could say, okay, after all, yeah, they, they, they are interesting, they are special, but okay, I mean, what can we do? Um, however, once you move to a quantum theory, there are certain things that uh, sometimes people call mysteries. So that's why I'm putting it in the quotation mark. Uh, so first thing, so it turns out that black holes, they saturate a, a bound on information storage, or so-called we measure information by entropy, and so black holes saturate so-called Bekenstein bound on information storage, on entropy. So what does it mean? It means that if for a given radius, if I give you a certain sphere, um, the, the maximal information that you can store in this sphere is accounted by a black hole. You cannot store more information. If you try to do it, the black hole will grow, basically. This is what will happen. So black holes uh, saturate the bound on information storage, okay? So which means that if you want to create a computer, so let's say, imagine that our civilization advances uh, infinitely. You want to create a very compact uh, computer chip or memory disk, uh, there's a limit. You can, once you hit a black hole, that's, that's the end of the story. You cannot make it more efficient for information storage than a black hole, okay? After that, if you try to make it more efficient, it will grow, okay? So now, um, Bekenstein bound says that if you have, look, now this bound is very general, okay? So this bound is, has nothing to do a priori with gravity. So it just tells you that if you have a spherical a sphere of radius r, uh, and mass m, this is the maximum entropy it can have, okay? It doesn't have to have that entropy. Most of the objects, like for instance, this object here, um, doesn't saturate the bound. Usually the entropy is, is way smaller, but that's the bound, okay? Now, the saturation is okay. After all, it's not so, maybe not so surprising. But uh, what emerges from this saturation is that um, saturation is, happens in a very funny way, a very interesting way, uh, and here's why. So if I um, write down this Bekenstein bound um, for a black hole and then use the relation between the size of a black hole and its mass, and I plug it back, I discover that this entropy of a black hole actually scales as, scales as area. So that also has the name of Bekenstein, Bekenstein Hawking. This is Bekenstein Hawking entropy of a black hole. And it scales like area. So it scales like area in Planck units, in the units of the Planck length. Okay? Uh, again, here I restored this four temporarily. Uh, again, I will set it equal to one later. Uh, now, this many people found, and including myself, uh, found this surprising because it looks like that the information that you can squeeze, that you can pump in a, a system, grows as area instead of a volume, okay? Now, there is something, there must be something deep here, okay? Um, now, so in other words, think in the following way, okay? So, you can, you can bookkeep this information that is stored in, 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 in a black hole by imagining the black hole area 
is divided by small pixels of uh, Planck size pixels. And you have some imaginary degree of freedom that lives there, a qubit, for instance, right? So we, we store information, quantum information in qubits, quantum bits. A qubit is the simplest system that can be in two states, zero and one, right? So if you had a qubit populating each cell, each pixel on the surface of black hole area, uh, that's what would account for this information, okay? So that's how it looks like. And so this inspired uh, Gerald Toft and then many others uh, to formulate this so-called principle of holography, okay? So this was the beginning of this principle of holography. Now, now this principle, uh, we got it in many different incarnations. We, we have a great group here working on this uh, holography from different aspects and so on. So it sort of became uh, hit different branches. But the, the bottom line, the, the first inspiration historically, as, well, as far as I, I know, is, was, the, was the black hole area and the fact that black hole entropy scales like area. Okay, now the question is, we want to understand why area is something really fundamental about area. Are there really degrees of freedom living on the area? That looks surprising because if you tell an astrophysicist that, that, or, or, or doesn't matter, general relativist that uh, on the surface of a black hole there are real degrees of freedom, uh, it would be very surprising because normally we think that if you cross the horizon of a big black hole, nothing special happens. You are not really, you are not really experiencing any, any, any collision with anything. Or, okay? So then the question is why area? Now, there is a second sort of connected, again, mystery. Uh, many people consider this as a mystery. It started with, with Hawking. Um, why the information is not coming out? So you have this object that can store maximal amount of information. And actually, it is not sharing this information with anyone. So it's not coming out, OK? Because normal systems, when they store information, naively would think that they want to share, OK? For example, I came here, my brain stored some information, and you, you cannot stop me talking, right? Uh, <laughs> right? So we want to share. But OK, black hole is not like that, right? Um, and actually, how do we know this? Because uh, Hawking did this famous computation. You all heard about it. And he, com he did computation, and in computation, uh, it came out that the, the, the black hole radiates but it radiates in thermal spectrum. Now, the thermal spectrum carries no information by default because the only, only feature that th thermal spectrum has is the temperature, okay? However, the first thing is that uh, very often when people say that this is a mystery, um, okay, now there are different levels, right? So the first thing is you, you see something interesting you, then next level is you call it a mystery. Then you can call it a paradox. Then you can, then you can say a theory is nonsense and so on, right? So the question is where you stop and start understanding microscopic physics, right? Now, uh, sometimes people take this to very far. And in that case, people forget that, I mean, we forget, all of us, sometimes, that uh, actually the Hawking computation was done in a very, spe very special limit. So it was done because otherwise it's very hard to do. It's not because it's just it's um, uh, fine. Why? Because you see, he did computations when he could talk about geometry of a black hole undisturbed. Okay. So in other words, black hole radiates particles, but normally when something radiates, there is a back reaction. Now this back reaction is quantum. We don't know how to account for it without microscopic theory of, uh, of a black hole. So Hawking didn't have such a theory. So he had a theory which was semi-classical theory. So he had to take a limit in which semi-classical theory would become exact. That's why he did computation in that limit. So he took a limit in which the computation semi-classics works exactly and there are no corrections. There are no back, no back reaction. What is that limit? That limit is that you have to imagine that black hole is infinitely heavy and simultaneously gravity is infinitely weak. Okay, so you take the limit when mass goes to infinity, Newton's constant goes to zero, but you fix geometry fixed. So you keep 
the, the, the Schwarzschild radius uh, finite and fixed. So in this limit, uh, computation is exact. You can enjoy doing semi-classical computation because back reaction is really zero, okay? So this was done in this limit. Now, of course, in this limit, it's an exact result that black hole radiates in exactly thermal spectrum. And of course, it's not giving away information. However, in that limit, black hole is eternal. So it's very hard to say whether this is a puzzle because if something lives eternally and something is infinitely heavy, it acts like an infinite capacitor. And therefore, you don't really know whether this should be a puzzle, whether you should say that it's a puzzle. After all, it's maybe okay, right? So to answer this question, now the, the question is therefore, what happens at finite m? So of course, everybody agrees and this was also, I, 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 I assume, Hawking's understanding and everybody else's, that the reaction is small. Obviously, black hole is not infinitely heavy, but has, uh, I don't know, solar mass. The back reaction is small. But it, there is a caveat there, because back reaction is small, but also lifetime is very large. So you are always, you are always playing around with small back reaction, but it's spanned over a huge lifetime, okay? And therefore, the cumulative effect may be important. And this is the, this is the question, so, okay? So therefore, uh, for this, we need a microscopic theory of a black hole, okay? And um, so what I will do, I will offer you one at the very end, uh, but I will, I will reverse the, 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 the history. So first, I will step back and ask the following question. Let's see, let's check the facts. So my talk will be like this. I'll give you facts, okay? Uh, the only thing about those facts is that nobody thought about them in that way, okay? Once you think about them in that way, then finally we'll get, we'll see what to do, okay? All right, so this will be the, this will be the story, okay? So now the first thing that I want to ask is the following. Are black holes unique? You see, in physics, this is always how it works, right? When there is a system that we don't understand, one thing is to create a microscopic theory of this system and try to see. Another thing is to see if these type of properties repeat themselves in different systems of nature. Because if you discover that these systems, these properties repeat themselves, then you can establish some universality. Okay, you can then distill really fundamental points from secondary technicalities, okay? All right, so therefore, uh, what I will ask is, are black holes unique? And the, astonishingly, this, first, this question was never asked actually, in a sense, okay? Uh, and secondly, astonishingly, it turns out that they're not unique. And actually, there are infinite number of systems that behave exactly like that, except we never looked at them from that point of view. And I will explain what it means. In other words, all objects, in unitary theory, in unitary quantum theory, they behave like black holes once you force them to saturate the entropy bound, okay? So in other words, if I, the air in this room doesn't behave anything like a black hole, but if I manage the, to, to, to change parameters of the room in such a way that the air in this room saturates Bekenstein's entropy bound, and there also, turns out, there are also other bounds, uh, then it starts to behave like a black hole in all the aspects, okay? And let, let me... Yeah. Example. I could imagine, I saw you say, I go to the limit of M goes infinite and uh, T goes to zero, but I could imagine, right, if I just behave like a stupid uh, particle physicist, right, and uh, I go a tiny bit away from the limit and I can just go dive and yeah. perhaps I could tell myself that in that way, I can address at least, you know, the leading... You are absolutely right, yes. So you'll do that. Yeah, yeah, that's we'll that's try to do that, of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You are absolutely correct. Now, before I go into other systems, let me ask, I have to establish a dictionary. Uh, what to compare with what? And first, uh, let's ask, what is the physical meaning of the, of the Planck mass? Uh, Planck mass has many different physical meanings, but from the point of view of particle physicists, uh, and here I'm, 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 I'm just following people like Feynman, okay, who just think of gravity as a, as, a, as a quantum field theory. Now, um, 
so Einstein gravity is a theory of a dynamical metric. So there is a metric, dynamical metric, that defines the, the, the space-time metric. And this metric has, uh, so in this room, for instance, or in, in many places, most of the places in the universe, this metric is very close to flat metric. So you can think of it as a fluctuation on top of the flat metric. And so the, the degree of freedom that describes fluctuations on top of the flat metric is graviton. So it's a particle from the point of a particle physicist. Uh, quantum field theory is, uh, gravity is a theory of, a, of an excitation which carries spin two and zero mass. And so M Planck appears there as a decay constant of that particle, okay? So in other words, now gravitons are special because they interact universally. So graviton interacts with energy momentum tensor and so anything that carries energy momentum tensor will gravitate. Now, since gravity itself carries energy momentum tensor, the energy momentum, gravity itself gravitates. So therefore, gra gravitons interact with everyone else, including themselves. And you can think of it in terms of Feynman diagrams. And in these Feynman diagrams, there is a, you can form an analog of electromagnetic coupling constant, but for gravity. I will call it alpha gravity. And this constant is precisely given by M Planck times a Q here is the momentum transfer in your process, okay? So if you have a process of scattering, let's say, the momentum transfer Q de decides the how strong is gravity, okay? So, or if you think of graviton decaying into two particles, of course, the real graviton kinematically cannot decay into the particle because it's massless, but let's say off-shell graviton can, can. So it's a, it's a decay constant of graviton the Planck mass, from this point of view. Therefore, you can say that the, the black hole entropy is the area measured in units of graviton decay constant, okay? It's just re rephrasing the this, this same fact. Now we can, we are ready to compare with other objects, okay? Now, it turns out that there is infinite, as I said, this is true for arbitrary objects. Uh, of course, during the colloquium, I cannot make this, this the whole list. So I will um, just pick up, I, I, will, I, I will pick up the example that probably everybody understands and everybody knows. Take baryons in QCD, okay? Now, let's take theory, quantum chromodynamics, right? So in quantum chromodynamics, Quantum chromodynamics is a theory of uh, quarks and gluons, okay? So gluons are mediators of, of interaction. Um, and um, there are a certain number of quarks in nature. The important ones are the light ones, so I will limit myself with light quarks. So these are so-called U, D, and S quarks, and anti-quarks, anti-U, anti-D, anti-S. We call them flavors. So different types of quarks, we call them flavors. Each quark carries colors. So each quark comes in three colors. You can call them red, blue, I don't know, green, for instance. And then there are gluons. Gluons ca carry a pair of colors. Since gluons carry a pair of colors, they can convert quark into a quark. They can absorb color and they can emit color, okay? Now, this is again notations introduced by Toft. This is double line notations. I will mention Toft many times in this talk because I, I will use certain things that he pioneered. So for instance, gluon can go into up quark of two different colors or gluons can interact themselves. And so there is a coupling constant which we call QCD coupling constant alpha, which measures the strength of the interaction, okay? Now, you, you all heard about this. There was even a Nobel Prize for that. That, okay, QCD is asymptotically free, which means that the coupling, uh, the strength of the interaction depends on the momentum transfer, depends on the scale at which you're probing it. And so in ultraviolet, at high, uh, high momentum transfer, high energies, uh, the coupling diminishes. So QCD asymptotically becomes a free theory, okay? And uh, correspondingly, at low energies, QCD becomes a strongly interacting theory. And there is a scale, a famous QCD scale, where QCD hits the strong coupling. Now, this running is controlled by coefficients of beta function. 
and uh, so you want this to be negative, okay? So therefore, this measures number of quark flavors. So for instance, in, in normal QCD that describes our world, there is a limit on how many flavors you can introduce in order not to spoil asymptotic freedom. Now, this is really a consistency requirement on the theory because if theory will become asymptotically non-free, then it will violate unitarity in ultraviolet. So, and so therefore, this uh, for real QCD is a consistency requirement. I mean, the, the number of real flavors that we have in the standard model is less, so. Now, what happens at the QCD scale is that when you come down from high energies to low energies, large distances, meaning, right? So large distances, the QCD becomes confining, okay? Uh, so what happens is that if you have quark and anti-quark, and if you try to pull them apart, it, if you separate them by a distance larger than the QCD length, this, this chromoelectric field will form a tube, and it will start to confine quarks. Uh, and then if you try very hard to pull them apart, it, the, the, the tube will break, okay? In fact, if quarks are massless, then this tube will break immediate, almost immediately. That's what is happening in, in, in real QCD. So what happens is the QCD, at low, therefore, asymptotically, it forms particles that carry no color because of this confinement. This is a famous phenomena of confinement, okay? So, it called, so meanwhile, in QCD, the second thing is happening. You heard many times about this. I'm just reminding you um, that what happens is that together with confinement, the confinement is accompanied by breaking, spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry. So what happens is that QCD forms quark anti-quark condensate, sort of similar to, to Cooper pair in superconductor. And so our vacuum, the vacuum that we live in, is filled with this quark condensate. And this quark condensate breaks spontaneously, not color, it's color, it's color blind, but it breaks spontaneously certain global symmetry because before there was a symmetry to rotate independently left quarks and right quarks or, or quarks and anti-quarks differently, and now the symmetry is broken spontaneously, it gets locked. So therefore, two U3 symmetries are broken down to U, U3 diagonal, and correspondingly, you have massless particles, uh, would be massless, light particles, uh, goldstone bosons, uh, number goldstone bosons. These are pions, kaons, and so on, okay? So for example, this is the goldstone octet made out of three quarks. You have seen this picture many times. And so they have different quark compositions. Now the thing is that this, this, this goldstone octet, of course their masses are split. Their masses are split because quarks have masses. And because quarks have masses, the symmetry that is spontaneously broken was also explicitly broken. And so therefore, it's like having a magnetic field. So the, the quark masses play the same role as magnetic field would play in the in spin symmetry, okay? So in, if you have, let's say, spin waves or phonons or whatever with external magnetic field, they, they, they become massive. So it's the same, same story here. Now, if quarks were massless, uh, then pions, octet would be degenerate. So it will be, instead of having different pions, kaons, etc., we will simply have an octet of massless goldstone bosons, okay? Now, what about baryons? The QCD also forms baryons. Baryons, for, again, they form multiplets. For example, here I'm displaying baryon of spin one, sp sorry, spin one half. So for example, neutron and proton, okay? So neutron and proton, they are made by, they are different because they are made out of different flavors of quarks. So in other words, they form a flavor multiplet. Again, uh, because quarks, if quarks were degenerate massless, let's take quarks to be massless, okay? If quarks were massless and electrically neutral, okay, this multiplet would be degenerate. So you would have one, you would, then you would say that you have one baryon of spin one half, which can be in many different states. The reason we say that these are different baryons, because they are split, because the symmetry is explicitly broken. But if symmetry were not broken, we would simply say, okay, there is one baryon, and it can be in 
it has spin one half, and it can be in different flavor states. So for example, we would say that proton and neutron are simply different microstates of the same baryon. So now the thing is, now let's compare with the black hole, right? So black hole has entropy, huge entropy, okay? Um, which means quantum mechanics means that black hole can be in many different microstates, uh, but it's the same macrostate. So a classical observer, if you're looking at a black hole which of the solar mass, for you it's just one black hole, classical black hole. In reality, it comes with a hidden label. That's what Bekenstein entropy is telling you. It tells you that it comes with a hidden label, and this label can take exponentially large number of values, enormous different number of values. Those are microstates of a black hole, which you cannot resolve classically, okay? Now, uh, if quarks were massless, baryon would form microstates, okay? So you would, so let's say an observer, Alice, would look at the baryon and would notice that it's a baryon, but it can be in many different microstates. So does it look like a black hole, a baryon? Now, of course you would say no. Not, nothing like a black hole. Why? Because the black hole, the baryon microstates are not hidden from Alice. She can do experiments. She can scatter pions, for instance, at the baryon and see what is the composition of the baryon. That's what we do. That's why we have these different baryons. We gave them different names precisely because we thought that there were different particles, right? And they are. Okay, also entropy of the baryon is very small. It's like something like log of 16. And of course, if you ask someone that if this looks like a black hole, they will tell you no. Of course, it has nothing to do with a black hole. But this is because here we are comparing apples with oranges. You cannot compare. You cannot, there is absolutely no, no point to compare baryon with a black hole unless you put them in a similar situation. It's meaningless to compare a normal baryon with entropy log of 16 and broken symmetry with a black hole. What you have to compare with a black hole is a baryon which has enormous entropy and see whether that kind of baryon would behave like a black hole. This is what we should do. Now, of course, this is new in the sense that nobody asks these questions. Nobody looks at the baryon uh, in this way. Uh, but as you know, the progress is made by precisely asking questions from different angles. Uh, that's how you, then you understand that something is happening. So, for example, if I take a black hole of the Earth mass, it approximately has a size of one centimeter, entropy of that black hole will be 10 to the 66. So, we can talk if I can give you a baryon with that entropy. Or in other words, if I give, can give you a baryon, that will have flavor multiplet of that dimensionality, of this huge dimensionality, exponent of that dimension. Then we can compare. Now, question is, can baryon have such a high entropy? Yes, the answer is yes, they can. This is not happening in real QCD, um, but it, it is happening in the relative of, of real QCD, which was actually pioneered by Toft, this limit. Uh, and we use it all the time for our calculations. This is QCD with large N, okay? So large number of colors. So you introduce QCD, um, with the uh, number of colors, n. Now, this is what Toft did. And then, in order to do computations, he noticed that there is a limit in which this QCD becomes almost classical. We call this today Toft's limit, okay? Now, what is the limit? The limit is that you take alpha to zero, the QCD coupling to zero, you have two, because you are taking number of colors to infinity. And you keep combination alpha times n, so-called Toft coupling, finite. 
Now, it turns out that this is, Toft coupling is the one that controls unitarity of the theory. So you, you don't want really to make it larger than, much larger than one, okay? So you keep it within unitary theory. Of course, simultaneously, the QCD scale is also kept fixed. Okay, so now, this is the limit. So I'm taking Toft limit, and I'm saying, now, let, now we are talking. Now let me compare baryon in this theory. Now, by the way, this theory is extremely well studied. I don't know, there are probably infinite number of papers about different aspects of, so I'm not inventing large MQCD, I'm a user, okay? Um, and um, now the question is, let me compare baryon in this theory to a black hole. Now, everything is ready-made because, for instance, baryon in this theory who I studied long ago, uh, for instance, by, so, so Witten in particular studied this, uh, has beautiful papers on, on, on understanding these baryons. Now, the baryons are bound state of quarks, but again, the same thing is happening. You see, this is, physics, of course, always repeats itself because when you have an object with high occupation number of constituents, that object effectively becomes classical. So it's like sort of gross pitayevsky limit in, in uh, many body physics. And so this is what happens with baryon. Baryon effectively in large MQCD becomes effectively classical. You can, you, you can even describe it as their beautiful uh, ideas by Skirm and then Witten uh, showed uh, that the, this, this becomes exact in large MQCD. You can de describe baryon as a soliton, as a classical soliton. I will not go, unfortunately, I don't have time to go there in, the, in this talk, but, um, but this is what I understood. So what is happening with baryon in that limit? A baryon mass scales as n, n times lambda QCD. Uh, the size is fixed. The size of baryon is fixed by the QCD scale. Okay, so we have this situation that you have baryon. This baryon is, comp you can think of it as composed out of quarks or composed out of pions, okay? Now, pions are massless in this theory because, uh, because this, in this theory, I'm, 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 not I'm not breaking flavor symmetry. I'm considering QCD with unbroken flavor symmetry. So pions are massless, and there's a huge number of pions, again, okay? Infinite number of pions. And, and pions, pion decay constant scales as square root of n, okay? These are known facts. I'm just uh, recalling. So the pions, the pion pion scattering, for instance, is suppressed by Q square like F pi square. So the, 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 the pion decay constant plays the same role for pions as Planck, Planck mass plays for gravitons. It's one to one, okay? It just sets the interaction strength. Okay, so now, now in this theory, so I have this baryon, and now I'm asking an original question, which was never asked to my knowledge, that, okay, now I have this baryon, and now let me push baryon to saturate Bekenstein's entropy bound to have maximal entropy. For that, what, what, what the procedure is straightforward. You have to increase the flavor group until you hit the limit, okay? Now, baryon, when you increase the number of flavors, baryon trans starts to transform as a huge representation of fla flavor group, actually exponentially large representation of the flavor group because it consists of many, many quarks. Uh, and actually, the number of states gr grows as this binomial coefficient, which again is exponentially large. And the entropy at the saturation point scales as n. Uh, now, the maximal entropy, so the, the, the following facts emerge. Okay, so here is the first new point. First new point is that what do we discover is that baryon saturates the entropy bound precisely when number of flavors becomes of order number of colors. In other words, that's precisely where theory is on the verge of not becoming asymptotically free, so it's bounded by asymptotic freedom, and unitarity, precisely where, where Toft coupling is order one. So in other words, what we are learning, and this is new, that the saturation of the entropy bound comes from saturation of unitarity. So you can only saturate entropy bound in, in a given state, for a given state, if the same state saturates unitarity, okay, of the theory. Secondly, so yeah, here is again, it's written explicitly. So the number of flavors should not exceed this number because otherwise theory becomes asymptotically non-free. So it's really amazing what happens, right? It's really fantastic because the baryon 
uh, really achieves the saturation of the entropy bound, just like a black hole, precisely where theory tells it to stop. It cannot continue farther. So this is a completely new and different understanding of Bekenstein's bound from completely different perspective. Yeah, sure. When you say the Bekenstein bound, do you take the area of this? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah. No, no, uh, Bekenstein bound is not area. Area, it comes out as an area for a black hole. That's what the mystery, remember. Bekenstein bound is simply mass times the size. So in other words, Bekenstein bound tells you that the, the entropy, maximal entropy is the mass times size. This, this is the Bekenstein bound, okay? So now you ask this question, when does baryon saturate this? And you get, again, the same, again, now, now comes the, the surprise. Uh, so the first thing, as I said, you saturate this with a baryon when theory saturates unitarity, okay? And secondly, this is the maximal entropy, right? Now plug here the numbers. The baryon mass scales like n. The size is uh, lambda QCD. So maximal entropy that can be attained is n. And this is exactly the area in, in the units of pi on the k constant. So baryon does exactly what black hole does with graviton, okay? So the baryon entropy at the point of saturation of entropy is controlled by unitarity. This is new knowledge because with black holes, we, we didn't, nobody made this connection. But moreover, it's always area law. Now, um, now if you would ask Alice, suppose Alice lives in this world in, in which baryon saturates the entropy bound, right? Alice would make exactly the same conclusions about baryon as we are making about black hole. Alice would say, okay, wait. So baryon entropy is area times pi on decay constant. Well, this means that the, the, the information, the way baryon stores information, as if the baryon surface is divided by small pixels and each can take the, the value zero or one and the size of the pixels is given by pi on decay constant. Now, pi on decay constant, of course, is the, precisely is the, is the scale of the theory of Alice. So for Alice, in the, in the toy world of QCD, Alice knows pi on decay constant. For, for her, it's a Planck scale, okay? Um, so, so, uh, the, so Alice would precisely formulate holographic principle for a baryon. Exactly, because there is no reason why not to, because Gerald formulated for a black hole, so it's... Uh, and others, uh, there were several papers after, many papers after that. Now, notice that, so next thing is that in the Toft limit, actually Toft limit is one to one, if you think it's way, to Hawking limit. This is precisely the point. So in the Toft limit, what happens? Re uh, recall, in the, in the Hawking limit, Planck scale goes to infinity, R is finite, the mass of a black hole goes to infinity. It's exactly the same thing that is happening in Toft limit for a baryon. Now, in, in this limit, uh, baryon is not releasing any information. It behaves exactly like a black hole. It locks up, it develops a information horizon. It locks up all the constituent uh, pions that ca could carry any message in, uh, behind this information horizon uh, and releases no information. So at infinite n, infinite n is the same thing as semi-classical black hole, and we see exactly the same thing. What happens is that uh, baryon, if you, if you allow it to decay, uh, there's no problem. You can, for instance, put baryon, you can make baryon which is excited and decays, etc. Uh, there's no problem. And you can see that it literally emits as if it's a black hole. So it emits pions, but for Alice, at infinite n, there is no way to detect what is the flavor of the pion. Why? Uh, Alice requires infinite time to measure the flavor of the pion. That's, that, that's obvious. Why? Because the number of flavors is infinite, and the coupling is infinitely weak. So Alice sees some a particle coming out. What she has to do, she has to put a detector and check the flavor. But that takes infinite time, because the coupling is zero. Okay? Now, at finite n, so let, therefore, let's go back to finite n. In finite n, we see the following, that the at t equals zero, so this, now this is the experiment Alice is doing. So Alice has this baryon, baryon emits pions. Now Alice has detectors, and Alice is checking pions. 
and uh, at equal zero, she cannot really get any information. First, because again, coupling is suppressed, so it takes time, long time to measure the, what, is the, what are the quantum numbers of the pion that come out. But also, if she detects one pion, since there are n pions locked up in the, inside the baryon, she will not really be able to really tell the message. It's like if I give you a book and only first symbol of the book. You can already tell me what this book about, right? So what happens is that after the time, which is n times approximately n times RB, <coughs> that's when Alice starts to really realize, understand what, bar, what, is the, what are the flavors of pions, and start to read out the interior of a parion. So after that time, the, the baryon starts to release a message to pion. Actually, it's incredible that precisely this time scale was postulated without any microscopic theory by Page uh, some time ago in the 90s for a black hole. Now it's sort of commonly believed that black hole really starts to release information uh, after this time scale for a black hole, precisely after N, uh, without any, of course, no, no microscopic theory. Here we see why. We have ex precisely the, the same reason. Have yeah, yeah, sure. No, you can, um, so no, in, the, uh, in order not to be able to tell the flavor of the radiation, for that you don't really need to saturate the entropy bound. What we're saying is that you, you need to saturate the entropy bound for the area law. So it only becomes area law at the saturation point. So that's, that's what, and, and you only really get a horizon at that point, the information horizon at that point. So yeah, of course, the, yeah, readout energy, of course, that is simply a, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's less mysterious once you understand that the, the, the once you understand that baryon is a bunch of pions and they are extremely weakly interacting. Of course, you could, this what you are asking is absolutely correct because uh, I mean not being able to read out information would be true even if I give you simply two pions. If they are extremely weakly interacting, you have to wait a very long time. What I'm saying is that this seemingly trivial reason is the, re the real reason for also for baryons and also for black holes. It turns out. So it's as prosaic as that. So the, the reason why we cannot read information, I'll make it clear in one second. Okay, so this is temporary conclusion. I will have a couple of more, more transparency. So basically what we are learning is this. Now, uh, this, uh, I have checked this for, uh, I don't know, you cannot name a system. I checked for everything I knew, everything I knew and my, with, also with my student. Uh, for instance, for different types of solitons, for lamps of the fields, for monopoles, for everything, okay? Uh, instantons, and this is the same story repeats itself, okay? So these are universal features. So universally, the fact is that once you bring a system to the saturation point, once the system is, has n equals one over alpha, all the systems at the saturation point, they behave like black holes with, in, in all the respects. Now, we call this, uh, so there are two aspects of it, right? So one is self-sustainability, that's this condition, so for system to be self-sustained. And second is to saturate the bound. These are two independent things. In principle, you can have systems that are self-sustained, but do not saturate the bound. Then, of course, this analogy will not work, okay? So it should be the self-sustained and saturate the entropy bound, then it's one to one. Now, we call this uh, maximal packing or point of saturation. And these points are usually points of quantum criticality. That's why they are very interesting because they are analog systems in condensed matter physics and stuff, which we can study from this point of view, okay? Now, this brings me to this, I told you, I promised you to, to tell you about microscopic theory of a black hole. Now, this theory was introduced before we, uh, before we understood all these points, okay? This, this, that this, this similarity goes in such a striking way, okay? Uh, so this was with a collaborator of mine, Cesar Gomez. And our idea was that black hole is a, again, saturated state, exactly this. So what, what our point was that the black hole represents a saturated state of soft gravitons. So you have uh, an essentially n graviton state. Uh, and uh, once, you, once you give me a wavelength of those gravitons, once you give me the size of a black hole, you don't have to assume anything else. The, the rest follows. Um, so their number comes out to be one over alpha. It's precisely the saturated state. And um, 
why? So you see, this is again, again another thing that it, it, all the systems that saturate the entropy bound, they behave similarly. This is the power of this saturation, power of large end physics. That the details, it turns out, that, well, that's what we are observing. Details do not matter. It doesn't really matter that it's gravity or non gravity. Once you are at the saturation point of criticality, the, everything is governed by this point. Um, so as I said, once you make this assumption, the rest follows. You, you, cannot, uh, you cannot change it. Uh, so therefore, for instance, in this theory, immediately you can understand Hawking radiation. The moment you make this hypothesis that black hole is a saturated state of gravitons, the rest follows. You immediately understand Bekenstein entropy. You immediately understand why it's area law. You understand Hawking radiation. What is Hawking radiation in this language? Well, Hawking radiation is a quantum depletion. Like condensates deplete, the, the graviton bound state also depletes because gravitons rescatter, and, and once in a while, graviton leaves the, the bound state. This is literally Hawking evaporation, Hawking radiation in this language. Okay? Um, then you can see that the quantum information starts to become readable after this time scale, which is, again, pages time. But we have a prediction. Now, we have a prediction, which is new, because we not only reproduce what is known about black holes, we have predict what is the prediction? Prediction is that we see, and I don't know how to change this, and I don't want to change this. We see that after half lifetime, black holes undergo what we call quantum breaking. In other words, the, the, the semi-classical description, the mean field descri semi-classical description, completely goes out of control, okay? So something dramatic is happening with the black hole description after half lifetime. It's page time, right, it's page time. Exactly, it comes out as a page time. We are not postulating or anything, it just it comes out, right. Uh, something dramatic, now what is happening, I don't know. And it's a, a very interesting, we are trying to understand. It's extremely interesting what is happening. I can, if there are the questions, I can tell you a few things that, that, that I, I know. Um, but it quantum breaks. So in other words, what is happening is that, uh, the bottom line is this, right? That you, of course, you thought that black hole was really black. But it's not really black. The, there is information encoded in one of our n corrections. So to the leading order in n, it's black. And it's featureless. But one of our n corrections are the ones that carry information. Now, one of our n corrections are minuscule. That's why it takes enormous time to, to resolve this information. But it's there. And uh, so that's what Alice can do. These are one over corrections that carry information, okay? And everything matches because it's exactly the same for a baryon. Okay, let me conclude. Uh, so what do we observe is that uh, laws of information are universal. And they are really governed by two things. They are governed by saturation. Uh, which is on its own controlled by unitarity. So it looks like the unitarity and the saturation, they control everything. And these are universal. And all the systems that I know, I don't know any counterexample, would be very surprising to, to, to have one. Uh, also would be interesting, of course. They behave in this way. Once they are brought to the saturation point and you respect unitarity, they behave like black holes. So therefore, of course, uh, I consider this as a strong evidence. Now, it's always beautiful when things are universal because then you connect many different things. Now, we have some proposals, for instance, for experiments in laboratory to, 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 to play around with criticality, to bring systems to the, to the critical point and then see how system evolves. Because all these pages times, reading out information and this kind of stuff, you can, it turns out you can read even in the simplest system. We showed this with a, student, a bunch of uh, students and, and, and Cesar. Um, even if you take a simple system of bosons on a ring, even there, if you have attractive interaction, you can bring this to the criticality. And so it's very interesting. Uh, so therefore, this would be my message about black holes. So it's a saturated state of soft gravitons. Let me finish here, and of course, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions.
Yeah. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah. I would say globalization are both good. You also yeah. energy. Yeah, that's right. And after some time. Right, that's exactly. So right. Yeah, so in other words, exactly. Yeah, I will repeat the question. So it's about eigenstate thermalization, the question. Um, so uh, this is one of the important questions precisely. This is related with this eigenstate thermalization. What happens after this time scale? Okay, so this one thing. Now, um, in general, okay, you can come up with a um, few time scales that are interesting, okay? Um, there is also the so-called scrambling time, uh, which was uh, was, was uh, Preskill and um, uh, Hayden and Preskill, Preskill suggested this uh, about um, uh, scrambling. That okay. The, uh, so now the thing is that uh, the question is how you want to define scrambling uh, for this type of system. For example, you can define it as, and, uh, I, and there is no final consensus uh, in, in, in my mind about that. So there is certainly one time scale in which the following happens. So you have, a, let's say, baryon or any critical system or a black hole, and you somehow send a message there, and then this message, message becomes one particle entangled. So that's one time scale. That time scale looks, looks like that time scale always com comes out to be logarithmic in n, okay? But that's not a complete loss of the message. It just message becomes one particle entangled. So it was like, think in the following way. The message is like sequence of zeros and ones. Okay, so you have, let's say, some, some degrees of freedom that are dialed. And then you are, 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 are putting this message in, your, in, the, in this system. And then one of, the, one of the degrees of freedom becomes entangled so that you can no longer make it com completely unentangled. But also it's not fully entangled. So, okay, so it's not completely lost really. So that time scale comes out to be logarithmic. Now, I don't know whether that is the time scale that I should call scrambling or there is something else. Then there is a full thermalization time scale. That's this. This is this time scale. Okay? So that's directly related with this eigenstate thermalization. This is exactly that you can see and tra we trace that that is what is happening. Right. So that's why, for instance, these type of systems are very nice laboratory to st study these type of things, like eigenstate thermalization, scrambling, because they are well-defined quantum field theoretic models, and even if you, are, if you are not interested in black holes, I mean, there we can do co computations at large n, uh, because these are renormalizable quantum field theories at large n, so you can do computations there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I fall into a black hole. Yes, yeah. I'm made out of fat and proteins. Yeah. Or right. Absolutely. I still have to right. Look at, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And somehow when I look at it, I mean, yeah. my understanding would be right. that in the world of, you know, uh, quarks and gluons, yeah. that they would feel a rise on, but, you know, a piece of fat would feel it like that. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Very, very good question. So the question was let me repeat the question. The question was about um, uh, causal structure of the horizon. And in particular, what happens with, a, with an observer that falls in, into, into a black hole, okay? And the question is whether the similar things can, we can apply to, to, to baryons, um, okay? Or baryons or other solitons. Now, of course, when I say first thing is that, of course, uh, baryons and uh, obviously baryon doesn't, <laughs> doesn't create any horizon for, a, for an object that doesn't carry color or doesn't interact through strong interaction, right? It, it, you can have a hypothetical object like neutrino or something that can simply, simply go through baryons. So the difference between, okay, this type of construction and, and gravity is gravity is universal. It creates a horizon for everyone, absolutely. Yeah. But that's a minor difference because, it's, because the, the counting uh, still in this system is, is exactly the same. Um, now, um, the causal structure, et cetera, et cetera, that's a geometric description of the story, right? So here, my approach is the following. Uh, I am a particle physicist, I'm an s matrix person, okay? So for me, the first goal it was here to understand black hole is an s matrix state, okay? Just like a baryon. So if I, let's say, collide two pions, I can create baryon, anti-baryon, okay? Uh, and then see what happens. 
uh, or, and this, similarly, I can create black hole as an intermediate state and see what happens without attempting to jump in across the horizon, etc. Now, these uh, geometric descriptions, of course, these are descriptions that emerge in large n limit. So, geometric description emerges in large n limit, and we see that the similar description also emerges in the case of systems like uh, skirmion or, or baryon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They also, you see that once you take large n limit, it's described by classical solution. This solution has horizons, horizon-like behavior for centered degrees of freedom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in that sense, it is affecting space-time. Uh, for, for, for a pion that falls inside in, in, into a baryon, the space-time is as affected as for an observer that falls inside a black hole. Because it's the effective metric where pion propagates it is determined by the interaction with the skirmion background field. And so, literally, Pion literally sees modification of the space-time metric. So, in that sense, it's not that different. It's really covariant. Well, okay. Of course, in QCD theory, we don't care about general covariance. Yeah, that's right, right, right. Of yeah. course, but it has its own covariance. Yeah. It's always covariance with respect to it. You can absolutely, yeah. So, this geometric description is emergent, and there you can define its own isometries. You can define. Uh, you can define uh, even 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 uh, induced metric and everything. Yeah, so you can just uh, okay, right. So that's the, you know, to 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 shout out the question a bit. Yeah. Uh -huh. Should I take these periodic black holes, as you say, as metaphors explaining an aspect of black hole physics? Yeah, absolutely. And should add to that the extra sort of uh, you know construct of uh, space time blah blah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. So, uh, in other words, other than they are not universal for everyone, so this, this, they only create space-time metric, et cetera, for their own participants. Um, other than that, they, in all the, literally in all the aspects, yeah. in, in all the aspects that is interesting for information, they behave like black holes. But, of course, as I said, if you really want to have something universal, gravity is the only one. So the, gra gravity is the only interaction that interacts with everyone. Uh, that's absolutely true, I, of course. That's, that goes without saying. I, I, I'm not, that, that aspect, of course, you cannot change of gravity no matter what you do. You, that, you are absolutely right, yeah. I have a question behind this. I'm looking at the time travel table, your questions, and then the No, it's area. That's what I said. The, the N is the area of the baryon in the... In the uh, N is the number of flavors, right? Or, or yeah, N is the number of... Where was this thing? Yeah, here, right? Right. So, uh, N is the way that the mass scales. So, it, so the baryon mass scales as n, right? Also, black hole mass scales as n, of course. The black hole mass is, is, is literally one to one. I thought I wrote it somewhere, but uh, in any case, where is this? Over? So the black hole mass, this is literally n divided by r. So baryon mass is also n divided by r baryon. So it's exactly the same scaling. So black hole, black hole mass scales is n, baryon mass scales is n. And in both cases, n is the square of the decay constant of, of a corresponding degree of freedom. So that's why it scales like area, the entropy. It's exactly the same, one to one. So the, the entropy for, a, for so this formula, when you, once you apply it to a black hole, this tells you that the entropy goes like n. And this is precisely R times M Planck square. And for baryon, this is precisely the same formula, da, da, da. This is precisely R times F pi square. So it's, 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 it's area in the units of the decay constant of the relevant degree of freedom. It's just one to one, yeah. But why, why so the question was whether it scales as a volume. But why did you say volume? No, I mean, volume would scale like uh, N3 halves. So the volume scaling would be N3 half for a black hole, for instance, also for, for, for baryon. Okay. 
because the radius, the, the, I mean, the radius scales as square root of n. Uh, so in, in, in Planck, if you want to use Planck units, etc. But, but the important thing is to, 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 to normalize. You have to establish a rigorous dictionary. And the rigorous dictionary is that it's always the decay constant of a degree of freedom. I have to measure it in the same decay constant. And it's not scaling as volume. It scales as number of flavors at the saturation point. No, no, absolutely. But number of flavors is not a volume. Number of flavors simply what number of flavors in your theory. And unitarity tells you that it has to scale as number of flavors at the saturation point. That's highly non-trivial because a priori, naively, you could think, oh, I can make entropy of a baryon infinite. No problem. I can take huge flavor group. It will form huge representation of the flavor group. And entropy is unlimited. So the key observation is that you cannot do it by unitarity. This is first thing, OK? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah. Will be, there will be plenty of time for Monday, no? uh, week after, right? Yeah, two weeks. Oh, okay. Apparently, yeah. That's. Uh, I mean, I am available, but. Uh, no, no. Yeah. no, sorry, no, you're right. It's next week. No, I was told not two weeks. Just to make sure that I don't do the same thing that I did. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. You can come over also anytime and uh, yeah, we can chat. Asking, if the question is short, I will take it after, after um, the other one. My, my question was, um, it's, it's known from conservative quantum gravity that the gravitational amplitudes are related to Bibble and Mills. Yeah, that's another connection, but it, I'm not using that. Yeah, that, But that yeah. also is a road to uh, derive this kind of result. Yeah, the, right. So the question was, there is this, uh, you probably heard, there is this sort of uh, this observation that somehow amplitudes, gravitational amplitudes, they in certain sense can be represented as square of, of gauge amplitudes. And so the question was whether this also uh, carries some message about this connection. Uh, I mean, frankly, I don't know really whether that, because here I'm saying even something more dramatic. I'm saying you don't even need gauge theory. The explicit examples, every time you have saturation with global symmetry, without gauge theory, saturation always does the same. So uh, therefore, I don't know how specific ro specifically the role of this double, uh, double copy or the double um, square, square gravity is equal to gauge square is played in, in, in this. But probably there is something there also. I mean, look, usually in physics, everything is interrelated. And if we think, then we will say, oh, wait a minute, this was there. And OK, clearly, there is this connection. So obviously, probably there are connections everywhere. Um, I mean, I didn't use that. That's why, of course, I'm not, I mean, there are plenty of interesting approaches to, 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 to understand gravity, quantum gravity. And as I said, people here are working on holography and a, a, a fantastic group. Uh, but yeah, this is a very specific approach. Uh, very minimalistic, I don't know. Sometimes people call it Occam's razor or something. I don't call it like that, but whatever it is. Yeah. Martin, if you want to ask a question, is it, is it good? Maybe a very minor question. Uh, in this relation you wrote in the blackboard, right. uh, you, you say that MR is equal to MR squared, and so. What is square? Uh, you mean this so one? Yeah, M, M plus. Played by the momentum transfer squared, uh, which is lost in this equation. The um, so this you mean momentum? The question is yeah. Question is about Q or what? Question is about Q. Yes, yes. So no Q. Play some role. No here. Well, okay. In this expression, not so much because I just said that the alpha gravity is Q square over m Planck square, and alpha of pi on is Q square over f phi square. Q is irrelevant. For arbitrary Q, this, this is the relation for any Q. Now, there is a whole story about amplitudes. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to discuss that. There is a relation from here to the amplitudes. For instance, in case of black hole, uh, it turns out that, uh, for instance, the, the amplitude that um, is responsible for black hole creation is 2 to n with momentum transfer, which is given by the would be Schwarzschild radius, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a whole story there that I didn't discuss, but okay, there this Q plays the role, but 
in this discussion, Q is just arbitrary scale. For any scale, this is the alpha, alpha gravity and alpha pi, right? Yeah, those are the Blackboard lectures, so. <laughs> and uh, yeah. by all means, throw your questions. Uh, um, he's here, so just come upstairs uh, to the second floor and uh, talk with him. Okay, let's thank him again. Thank you.